Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Q&A session on COVID-19 organized by Science Communication Hub Nigeria, Train in Africa and the African Science Literacy Network in collaboration with Africa Archives. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Mahmoud Bukarmaina, and uh, I'm, I'm a member of these different organizations. And uh, with me today are three experts, Dr. Jamilu uh, Nikau, Dr. Abrozak Ibrahim, and uh, Dr. Lazarus Joseph Goje. I'm going to tell you a little bit about them before we go into the discussion. So uh, Dr. Lazarus had his BSc and MSc in biochemistry at the University of Medigree, uh, then uh, pursued associate certificate in medical laboratory science at the University of Jos, Nigeria, and then he pursued his PhD at the University of Sussex in the UK where he worked with Neil, Professor Neil Crickmo, uh, Dr. Neil Crickmo in the School of Life Sciences. He has expertise in biochemistry, genetic manipulation and molecular biology, and he has published widely in peer-reviewed journals and serves as reviewer for many journals. He's currently based at the Department of Biochemistry, Gombe State University in Nigeria, and he's also a member of many different organizations, including the Biochemical Society UK, uh, the Society for In Vitro Pathology, Nigerian Society for Biochemistry and Molecular, Molecular Biology, and uh, so on. And uh, Dr. Jamilu is a medical doctor and a field epidemiologist. He was involved in several disease outbreak response in Nigeria and has served in national emergency operating centers for cerebrospinal meningitis, for example, cholera, Lassa fever, and yellow fever outbreaks. He is currently working with the National Malaria Elimination Program as the focal person of seasonal malaria chemo prevention. Dr. Nikau is responsible for coordinating stakeholders supporting the seasonal malaria chemo, chemo prevention in Nigeria, tracking progress and helping in mobilizing resources to scale up SMS implementation. He has contributed to the development of several malaria case management guidelines and training materials Previously, he served as a team leader of his TED support team from um, the National Malaria Elimination Program that helped several states in Nigeria in the planning and implementation of mosquito nets, mass campaigns. And uh, finally, Dr. Abdurrazak Ibrahim is a biotechnologist with experience in tissue culture and genetic transformation, molecular techniques, RNA interference technology, he developed and patented a technology for the control of white fly using RNA interference technology in Embrapa, Brazil, where he spent nearly 10 years. He's a lecturer in the Department of Biochemistry, Ahmad Bello University, Zaria, and a scientist with Forum for Agricultural Research in Africa. He has taught several courses in biology, agriculture, and medical biochemistry, plant science, agricultural biotechnology, nutrition by safety ATC and at undergraduate and postgraduate levels and supervises research projects at the different levels. He is the editor-in-chief of the Nigerian Journal of Biotechnology and has published several peer-reviewed articles. He has been involved in the development of continental and national agenda and policies on agricultural biotechnology at the African Union Commission and in Nigeria and serves as a research person for the country's biotechnology development agency. And uh, he's a member of the National Standing Committee on R&D of Tetphone, Nigeria, and advisory board member of the Foundation for Smoke-Free Wall in USA. So welcome all of you to this program. And uh, it's, uh, it's great to have you um, answer the questions that people have sent us on COVID-19. Um, so before we go into the question and answer session, I'll probably just tell you a little bit about this disease. So uh, nearly 300, nearly 3 million people are currently infected by disease. And out of this, about 200,000 have died. Of course, the recovery rate is also very good. About 840,000 people have recovered from this disease. So this is a serious disease. And uh, as you all know, it's kind of becoming quite clear that in Nigeria as well, the number of cases are increasing. And it is for this reason, it's absolutely important that we follow the guidance given by experts. And also when we have misconceptions, it's absolutely important that we get them clarified by experts. And I'm quite excited that we have experts with different expertise in today's webinar 
who would clear some of the doubts in the questions that you sent. So without wasting time, I would go straight into the Q&A. And uh, I think the first question that we received was on the, this. But I'll probably ask Dr. Lazarus, tell us what is a virus and how does it differ from bacteria and other pathogens? Thank you, Dr. Mahmoud. You've done the introduction, so let me go ahead and answer the question. Virus is a microscopic infectious agent, which is uh, mostly comprised of uh, nucleic acid. Nucleic acid can come in the form of RNA or DNA, but it, does, it doesn't have all the two. It will have either one of these, either RNA or DNA, enclosed in a protein, which is known as capsid. And some of, in some viruses, these uh, capsid are normally surrounded by lipid layer. Example of such is a SARS-CoV-2, which is a causative agent for COVID-19. So in the case of uh, COVID-19, it has uh, some protrusion, which is known as a spike. And these ones are what attach to the receptor on the cell membrane of the host. So the next one is about uh, how does this differ from bacteria and other pathogens? Viruses do differ from bacteria and other pathogens in the sense that viruses appear to be non-living when they are outside the system of the host. That is to say, if they are outside the system of the host, they cannot reproduce and they cannot carry out normal metabolic functions. So that is why they are regarded as non-living. They are only alive if they get attached to the host system where they hijack the biosynthetic machinery of the host system and direct it to synthesize more of the viral particles. Whereas in the case of bacteria and other pathogens, they have the ability to reproduce even outside the host uh, organisms. They have that ability to capture nutrients and reproduce their own kinds. Fantastic. Thank you. So clearly from this answer, for those of you who are listening, viruses need to be in the host system before they can reproduce, before they can be alive, yeah? So now, uh, Lazarus, uh, let me ask you this question again. How does COVID-19, well, probably the right question should be, how does SARS-CoV-2 get transmitted? Yeah, SARS-CoV-2 get transmitted in different ways, even though there are still ongoing studies in this area because people are still puzzled about different ways some people happen to contract the virus. But the ones that are well known at the moment is uh, respiratory tract uh, droplets, two respiratory tract uh, droplets. That is, if somebody who has the infection happens to cough or sneeze, and even if he speaks very close to you, you will contract the virus, you can breathe in the virus. And when, it, when you breathe it in, it can get it can affect the respiratory tract as such causing disease and also it can be transmitted through surface contacts and that is a study that has been carried out in singapore reported by the cdc they get to realize that uh, SARS-CoV-2 can survive in either plastic surface or in steel surface for up to three days and it can survive in cardboard for up to like uh, 24 hours, whereas in copper surfaces, it can survive for up to four hours. Therefore, within this period, if somebody who is infected with uh, SARS-CoV-2 happen to touch any object and all, all respiratory droplets coming from such a person dropped on such surfaces, and you happen to touch them with your bare hands, you may come in contact with either your nose, mouth, or eye by putting your hands on them. So in such a case, you will get uh, infected with the virus. So that's why people are advised to maintain some physical dis distance of at least two meters from each other to avoid the spread of the disease. Thank you. Fantastic. Okay, so uh, I guess I'm gonna go to uh, Dr. Jamilu Nikau. Uh, Jamilu, if you could tell us who is at an increased risk of falling ill from the SARS-CoV-2?
Uh, I think we need, uh, you are muted, so if you can unmute yourself. All right, thank you very much for the question. Mm -hmm. I think this is a very important question. Um, uh, in epidemiology, you actually categorize uh, uh, people based on their risks. Um, the virus, anybody that comes in contact with the virus can get infected with the virus, and the virus can multiply in him. However, there are certain classes of people that uh, have higher risks of uh, becoming ill, or even becoming very ill, or even dying from the uh, disease. So for regarding uh, the center of the people at uh, higher risk of becoming ill, we have uh, the elderly, uh, people that are with advanced age, uh, usually the virus is uh, very mild on children. Um, children under the age of uh, nine years, most of them don't even have symptoms, and even if they have, they don't have severe disease. And uh, as one, as the age increase, the uh, possibility of severe infections increases too. Um, uh, in uh, epidemiology, there is what is called case fatality rate, uh, which uh, denotes uh, uh, the severity of a disease. That's uh, among the people that are infected, how many of them will die? That's the case fatality. So if a uh, disease, uh, uh, 100 people get infected and then maybe uh, seven die, um, the case fatality rate uh, is, uh, let's say, 7%, 7 out of 100. So for uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus infection, that is the COVID-19 disease, uh, the case fatality rate is currently around 3.5%. That means 3.5 persons die. However, this, uh, the mortality uh, differs according to uh, age group and certain condition. For age, uh, the case fatality rate for people less than uh, nine years is just about 0 0.2, uh, 0 0.0%, uh, 0 0.00, maybe 2%. And those over, uh, less than the age of eight, uh, less than 40 years, the case fatality rate is about 0.2%. That means if about 1,000 people died, uh, got infected of the, in, within those age group, um, only about uh, uh, two will uh, die from the disease. Uh, most of most the vast majority will not have uh, severe disease. Uh, but however, for people above the age of 60, it's about 8 percent, and then people above the age of uh, as 80 years, the case fatality rate is about uh, 16 percent. So the more the higher their age, the more likely to get severe disease. And die from disease. So another category of uh, people that uh, get severe disease or uh, or become very ill after getting the virus, even though anybody can become infected, um, a vast majority of uh, people that are infected are asymptomatic or have mild symptoms. About eighty percent of uh, people that are infected either don't have any symptoms or they have very mild symptoms that are uh, negligible, and uh, only about twenty percent or 20, nineteen percent have severe disease. And out of it, about uh, four to five percent would require uh, admission into intensive care unit. So those with pre-existing condition, that those with certain medical condition, uh, have also a risk of becoming ill or severe ill or even dying from disease. So those conditions include uh, cardiovascular disease, uh, disease of the heart and blood vessels, like uh, uh, coronary heart tree disease, disease that affect the blood vessels of the heart, or myocardial infection or peripheral um, uh, artery diseases. Those, because already their system is compromised, they are high, at higher risk of dying. The case fatality rate is about 10.5%. Uh, While uh, other at risk groups are people who have diabetes, that have diabetes, that have hypertension, people with cancer have higher risk of uh, becoming ill or even dying from the, the disease. And also uh, there are uh, in, in this part of the world, in Africa, there are a lot of infectious diseases like HIV, tuberculosis, and other infectious diseases uh, that, are, that are chronic, they are long-standing, they are usually long-standing in people that have those diseases. So they, those diseases also compromise the defense, body defense system of uh, an individual, what is called immunity, and they are also at high risk of uh, dying from the disease. So thank you very much. Fantastic, fantastic. So in nutshell, what this means is that it may be that someone who kind of a, is young, you know, might get the disease, not showing that much symptoms, or if, in fact, not even being symptomatic, uh, remaining asymptomatic, but he might pass it to someone who is vulnerable, yeah? So in that's certain, and exactly. another thing is, oh uh, yeah, that's excellent. Uh, the disease, uh, most diseases, is usually the people that transmit disease are people that are infected, they are showing symptoms. But uh, unfortunately for SARS-CoV-2 infection, 
even people that are, don't have symptoms that don't, are not been facing with, and the common symptoms are cough, fever, and difficulty in breathing. So people don't have any of the symptoms and still have the ability to transmit the disease. And another thing is, uh, even though uh, the elderly and those with pre-existing conditions are at uh, a higher risk of dying, uh, other people are at, at age group are not invisible. They can also have severe disease, and there are instances in several parts of the world that people where the younger age people, people in their twenties and their thirties, that died from the disease. So everybody should take precaution because you're not even even though you are your age group may have uh, lower risk, but you can still succumb from the disease. Uh, so everybody should take uh, maximum precaution. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, now let's move on to the next question that was sent to us, uh, and this question is particularly probably to you, Dr. Abdul Razak. But you may. Yeah. Uh, so it says that people say COVID nineteen is totally false and a deception created by the Western world. It does not exist. In fact, it is a call to get some money. So the question is: Is COVID nineteen real? And I guess before you answer that, let me also uh, get you to respond. Uh, with this question as well, it says, was the virus deliberately created by the Western wall in the laboratory to depopulate world population? Yeah, well, sorry, I had a little technical problem. I don't know, am I clear? Can yep. you hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay, yes. Well, thank you very much, Mahmoud. This is a very interesting question. I, I think the two questions are very intimately related. Uh, thank you for bringing me to this platform. The first thing I would like to say before responding to this question is this. I think we need to understand that we need to we need more science in politics and less politics in science. What do I mean by that? It means although there are instruments and, and tools and ways and approaches that are scientifically established to solve problems, we should also try to avoid exploiting scientific uh, knowledge products, you know, for, to, to create confusion in politics. And because uh, some of these narratives are actually being peddled, you know, with this, this sort of uh, political confusion. If you look at, if you look at the, the scenario of uh, people advancing the idea that this virus was created in the lab, there's a political war, there's an economic war between among countries. Most of these narratives, they come from websites or YouTube channels that are more often than not uh, sort of clickbait. They want people to click on their link so that they get, you know, they get to have money out of that. Sometimes it's ideological. There are people who believe uh, maybe due to one ideology or another, they, they try to advance this kind of thinking. Others is because they're completely against vaccination. So the end result is try to prevent people to prepare your mind against rejecting, you know, to, to prepare your mind to reject vaccine that may be generated, you know, to, to, to treat or to, to control the disease. But what does the science say? You know, the science says that viruses have been around from the beginning of time. You know, they have always been with us. They have evolved as we evolve as humans and all the other organisms evolve. In fact, viruses can be found in plants, they're found in animals, they're found in bacteria. So for example, in humans, uh, a significant part of our DNA, which contains about 3 billion units of DNA, they consist of sequences from descendants of viruses that infected our ancestors over millions of years. And coronaviruses, <clears throat> They are a family of a particular virus that cause diseases around uh, respiratory diseases, ill, coughing, illness, and coughing. And this new, this particular SARS-CoV-2, which causes the COVID-19, is only recently identified. It has uh, created this pandemic. Now, and that's why it's given the name novel or new coronavirus. But the coronavirus is a family. They have been with us for, for a while. They have been with us, the evolutionary biology of the viruses, and the exchange of genetic material and information that they have been doing with living organisms, not just humans, but other, other animals has been going on for a while. Now, in terms of responding to whether the, the virus was created 
by the Western world and the lab to depopulate uh, the world. Uh, some will say it's in China, others will say it's from the US, you know, others will bring in the question of the, the, the fight between superpowers. In most cases, this narrative, it has Bill Gates being roped in as a scapegoat you know, to advance this narrative. Again, I would like to say that we need more science and politics, you know, and less politics and science. And in terms of the scientific studies, if, if, you want to, if you want to create an organism that will harm other people, what do you do? You look at a pre-existing organism that has some level of pathogenicity, take its DNA or RNA, depending on what kind of nucleic acid it sustains it, use that to clone and design. There are lots of processes. You put it in a computer, you simulate, you do in silico analysis, you look at all the, the tools available uh, in, the, in the reverse genetics system. You know, you assemble it. So it's a whole lot of process if, to engineer microorganism or to engineer even a, a protein or any biological product. So now, there's a recent comparative genome analysis that was conducted. You know, comparative genome analysis is the way scientists compare DNA of one organism and another to, to determine their degree of relatedness. So it can be established that uh, a child is the father, is, is, is the child of a father, then you can go down to the grandfather, to the great grandfather, all the way back. So you do this by comparing genomes. You can do it across species, you can do it within species, and so on. So this research is in the Department of Immunology and Microbiology of the Scripps Research Institute in the US. Uh, what they did, they proved that this SARS-CoV-2, which causes COVID-19, is not a laboratory construct or purposely manipulated virus. And how did they do that? They, they showed that by looking at the possible sequences from where the virus may have been obtained and therefore manipulated. So, for example, for the virus to attack a human cell, like the uh, Jamila I mentioned, for the virus to attack a human cell, it needs it's a sort of door, you know, what we call receptor. It needs wet holes and then get into the cell. So they, they studied all the DNA, the nucleic acid sequences of the virus, all the viruses and its relatives. They look at the, recept the DNA sequence of the receptors in humans and other related species that are also attacked by that kind of virus. And what they found out, the conclusion is that there's just no way a virus, this pathogenic, a virus that's, that causes the disease, this infectious, there's just no way it would have been synthesized or generated in the lab if it had not undergone the normal process of evolution, you know, by natural selection. If it had not jumped from a host, one host that ordinarily is its reservoir into another. So you remember I mentioned that uh, we, 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 we have billions of DNA that are ancestors of viruses, and other microorganisms that used to live in our ancestors and they are now in us and they really don't serve much purpose you know, in, in a manner of speaking. It's in the same way. We, we have reservoir viruses that are no longer pathogenic to us, but if, for example, maybe another organism can have uh, those viruses, it can cause diseases to them. So SARS-CoV-2, what evidence is showing is that SARS-CoV-2 which causes the COVID-19 uh, was reserved in, uh, in bat. So the reservoir host of the virus was bat, but then it jumped from the bat through pangolin into humans. The, the body of evidence shows that. And so uh, the process is through natural selection and through the normal zoonosis, you know, where in other words, there's, there's just no way this new virus would have evolved if there hadn't been this movement from the reservoir host, which is bat, to humans and to the intermediary, uh, and through the intermediary host. And that intermediary host has been shown to be pangolin. 
Now the genome data in this study conclusively, uh, convincingly proves this. There's a, uh, I don't know if you can show that, there's this, this alignment, what we call sequence alignment, which, which tries to show you the degree of relatedness between a host, you know, the sequences of interaction between a host and the virus that uh, attacks it. Okay, sorry, I, I think I missed that photo that you sent a while ago, so my apologies. Um, no, it's fine. <laughs> I think another thing to say is that if you look at it throughout history, we've had uh, several pandemics. Even the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic killed more people than the current pandemic, yeah? So, mm -hmm. and uh, at that stage, the, uh, we, you could say that our advancement in science hasn't reached the level of adv advancement that we are right now. So therefore, could we say that the 1918 pandemic was also created just to cause the aid to depopulate the world? So, uh, you know, thanks very much for, you know, going in depth to uh, answer that question. Uh, so let's move on to the next question. Um, so this question is specifically to you, Dr. Jamilu. It says that people think if you are infected with COVID-19, you have to look severely ill. Is this the case? I know that you did talk about it a little bit ago, but if you can expand this, that would be great. Uh, and you need to unmute yourself as well. Uh, this is a very important question. And uh, this is one of the areas that is causing a lot of confusion and misconception about this uh, COVID-19. As I mentioned earlier, um, about 80% of uh, people that are infected are either asymptomatic or have mild symptoms, symptoms that you can overlook maybe just mild cough or maybe mild uh, chest pain or just sore throat. These are symptoms that uh, we all have once in a while and uh, there's tendency that people just ignore these symptoms and uh, go away and do their own uh, normal things. But unfortunately, those people with bad symptoms and even the ones that are infected, that, are, that don't have any symptoms at all, can transmit this virus. They may have elderly people around them, their parents, their relatives that they visit and they can easily transmit this virus. So um, it's not everybody that actually looks severely ill. There are some uh, people that are at risk of becoming ill. Uh, we, I think we mentioned them, those with advanced ages and those with uh, 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 pre-existing conditions like diabetes, heart disease, uh, infections like HIV and tuberculosis. So, and even among those, it's not everybody that will have uh, those diseases. Mm -hmm. And uh, in Nigeria, I think what it was last week, uh, there are some uh, videos that were circulating from one of the state's isolation centers, uh, where some of the, uh, <laughs> where some of the uh, patients or so people with COVID-19 uh, complain that they don't have symptoms and those people have just uh, locked them in and they're not uh, doing about their normal activities. Uh, this is dangerous. And I think uh, it's very important for the general public to know that uh, if you have COVID, you may not have symptoms. In fact, majority of the people don't have symptoms. And uh, maybe as an example, um, uh, three governors got infected with COVID-19 in Nigeria. I think uh, the one of Bauchi, Kaduna, and Oyo State. And all of them, uh, they went into isolation and then they came back. And what almost all of them told us is that, yes, they have the virus, and most of them, they are asymptomatic. So they have the virus, they have the um, ability to transmit virus to other people and they can be asymptomatic. Uh, it's not everybody that has severe illness. And it's very important if you have the virus or if you get tested, you either go to a senior centers. You, in Nigeria, the policy is once you have the virus, there's a genetic assessment center in all the states. You go and isolate yourself until you are tested again. In fact, they are tested twice. No less than 24 hours and certified to be uh, free of the virus. So which means now, uh, which brings me to the next question. Uh, why are people being isolated? Because some people think that this is just happening for Nigeria to show, look, we have people infected, so please give us money to fight this virus. What is your response to that? Yeah, I think this is uh, something that uh, many people will be thinking about, but actually uh, it's not so. So in all the countries, it's not just in Nigeria, in all the countries that had this uh, pandemic, we, Nigeria started having this pandemic more than two months when, uh, about two months when China reported this pandemic. And data from China, from Europe, from America indicates that the vast majority of the people don't have the virus and they can't transmit this virus. So it's very important for people that are infected, persons that are infected, 
to be isolated because uh, the virus is affected uh, via human to human contact or maybe if you have contact with a contaminated surface. So um, the rationale in Nigeria is because, uh, where everybody should be isolated is we know our behaviors. Some people, if they ask to self isolate at home, the next day they will go to a wedding or to an annual ceremony or to a funeral. So and that's why the government up to now, up to today, the policy is for everybody that is affected to be uh, isolated in a, a specialized treatment centers. And when he develops symptoms or when he becomes severely ill, he will be managed accordingly. Uh, uh, they are not being isolated to show the number of cases. In fact, there are even worries in Nigeria and even outside Nigeria that we don't have enough cases of you know, yellow fever, um, uh, coronavirus in Nigeria. Um, the coronavirus has been with us for more than two months in Nigeria. And uh, for countries like Ghana, for like South Africa, like Egypt, all these uh, African countries, and they, report, they reported far, far, far more numbers of, of people that are infected with coronavirus. So probably, in fact, there is even weakness in the system. So more people need to be tested to identify people that are, are infected and for them to be properly isolated so that uh, the spread can be curtailed and less people have uh, the virus in Nigeria. So there is no any evidence that, in fact, um, many people are concerned. Uh, if you can look at it, uh, the European Union, US government, Chinese government, Nigeria is one of the hotspots for uh, spread of coronavirus and um, with the nature of the virus and then our nature as, as uh, humans, the nature of Nigerians, we like moving together. Some of us live in a crowded environment the higher chance of uh, this virus being easily spread among us. And that's why uh, people need to be isolated so that uh, the chance of spread will be reduced to the balance. Fantastic. This is really, really thorough and very helpful. All right. OK, so we're going to move on to the next question sent to us. Uh, oh, OK. <laughs> Abdul Razak, you see your picture just pop out. <laughs> yes. All right. <laughs> All right. Anyway. Well, I, 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 hmm. Yeah, we've it's, you know, so. I think we have addressed the question, but the, the, the central idea is that, you know, this, this is the kind of analysis that is usually conducted to try to determine the degree of relatedness and the evolutionary compatibility between a host mm -hmm. and its uh, invading microorganism. And, and what this figure shows, anybody interested, you know, can, can go and check it out. But what it, it really shows is that uh, the, the virus evolved through the normal evolutionary uh, process which and with interaction with our own behavior the way we eat the way we eat and so on as all organisms do mm. to, to this pathogenicity fantastic okay so um i wanted to now go back to dr lazarus so you know that was important, especially because trump also did mention something similar since hand sanitizers and other disinfectants kill the virus, why can't we inject this to, to clean the virus inside our body? Okay, thank you, Dr. Mahmoud. This is a very interesting question, actually. I was listening to the media brief by the US uh, COVID-19 Task Force and the President of the United States made mention of something similar to this because he was faced with a problem and trying to find a solution to it. So he was uh, asking the group of experts if there is a way, since this infectant happened to kill the virus within some few period of time, if there is a way we could like inject it into the system to clean the virus from, from the system. So this question actually generated a lot of uh, backlash and a lot of controversies. But uh, one could understand that uh, as a scientist, we know that uh, there are two ways you can carry out uh, investigation. We have what is called in vitro and we have what is called in vivo analysis. So most often times some agent that can kill a disease uh, organism outside the body system cannot work if the organism happened to be inside the body system that is in vivo. But apart from that, if you look at uh, hand sanitizers and disinfectants, these are clearly chemicals. And we know that uh, any chemical disinfectant is a poison. So there is no way you can inject poison into your system. By the time you inject poison, it may end up doing more harm than, than good. So people should uh, definitely refrain from the consumption of uh, either hand sanitizers or disinfectant. 
I was going through a particular report by the CDC from United States. They said that the level of uh, poisoning from January to March has increased by 12% in the USA. So they're trying to believe that perhaps it's because people think frequent uh, use of these disinfectant and hand sanitizers could cure the disease. But then some of them use it wrongly. Some of them use the hand sanitizer and still eat food without washing their hands. Some of them go and drink. There is a case of a child who went and drink uh, the hand sanitizer thinking it will cure the disease. And there is a particular woman as well in the US because she learned that uh, fruit should be washed properly before you eat. And she get to realize that this disinfectant, they happen to kill uh, microorganisms, including viruses, bacteria, and uh, fungi and the rest. So she now came and had 10% bleach into, into some reasonable quantity of water and pour her fruit inside. She now washed it. She ate it thinking whether it has now killed the parasite in that uh, food. At the end of the day, she end up at uh, A and E. So people are seriously advised to study very well. Ask experts on how to use this, uh, this uh, disinfectant in case you don't know how to use them and do not consume them. They are poison and they can definitely kill. Absolutely. So now, can regularly rinsing your nose with saline help prevent infection with the new coronavirus? Yeah, I could remember this comment uh, came up as a result of a comment made by one virologist from China who's, who think that I think he told that rinsing the nose with saline could uh, prevent infection with a uh, new coronavirus, but uh, experts have looked into that and they debunk this fact because it lacks scientific uh, evidences. This, uh, yeah, this uh, normal saline has not been shown to work with in any case of respiratory tract infection, so it's not uh, really working in the case of uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection. Therefore, even if you continue rinsing your nose with normal saline, if you if you already get infected with the virus, it won't stop it. And if you expose yourself and still rinse your nose with uh, normal saline, it won't stop you from getting infected. And that is why people are advised to exercise these uh, measures that have been always been uh, being emphasized: social distancing should be practiced. You avoid getting in close contact with uh, each other to avoid the spread of the disease because it is believed that if you give a distance of two meters even if it is a respiratory droplet it can fall on the ground by gravitational force so it won't get to it won't get to you so people are definitely advised to maintain social distancing and at the same time proper uh, use proper hygiene practice proper hygiene by washing their hands with soap or using a uh, hand based uh, i mean uh, alcohol based uh, hand rub to clean their hands these are the only way we can avoid the transmission of this uh, virus but not rinsing our nose with no nose saline thank you fantastic fantastic okay so now let's move on to the next question uh so I'll ask Dr. Abdul Razak, does the disease infect only rich people? Because I've seen a lot of videos in Nigeria, people saying, oh, you know, this is only for the rich and everything like that. Hmm. <laughs> this is a very interesting question. You know, it, it's, it's a question also related to mindset. But, but clearly, coronavirus disease affects everyone. You know, if you remember, just one month ago, we had just probably about four cases in Nigeria. Today we're talking around a thousand plus. Now take, if you check, uh, I don't have the data, but if you look at those numbers, you see that uh, they are rich and they are poor involved in, they have been infected by the virus. And in fact, as far back as February, early February, late January, the, the World Health Organization warned that they said no country should assume you can get cases of coronavirus, and that the virus neither respects borders nor distinguishes between races and ethnicities and economic uh, 
groups. So the World Health Organization has, has already clearly stated that uh, it affects everyone, the rich and the poor. In February, if, if you do a map of the spread of the disease, early February, if you do a map of the spread of the, spread of the disease, what you would see is that it was more prevalent in, in rich countries, from China, went to Spain, parts of Europe, uh, US. Now, if you have that map, and it has a label, you know, the spread of coronavirus disease in the world, if you remove that label and replace it with another label, say GDP per capita, to be the same. You know, if you remove the label and you replace it uh, with, uh, it, it can also be testing capacity, it can also be GDP per capita that correlates with air travel. It also correlates with health resources per capita. So you will see that the, the reason why in, in the beginning there were more uh, cases in rich countries is because those countries had more health resources and therefore had more testing capacities. And because they were richer, they traveled more. So it is only now that gradually it's coming down to the poorer countries like Nigeria and so on. So it is wrong to assume that it does not affect uh, the poor. In fact, back when HIV broke out, many people in Africa, I remember, uh, we used to think, people used to think that this was a disease for the white people, it was a disease for the gay. Uh, but then today, Africa became the headquarters, the epicenter of this disease. I think it still is many parts of Africa, the Eastern. Mm. Part, yeah, and so so yeah. it is correct to say that it affects only the rich. You know, mm. There might be some economic dynamics at play. I'm not an expert in, in mapping uh, these parameters, but you know, clearly the, what, what it shows is that uh, it affects everyone, the rich and the poor. Fantastic, fantastic. All right. So, if I, may, I mean, I think, if I may maybe add, I think that Dr. Zak has uh, wonderfully shows that uh, <laughs> And there's no distinction between uh, rich and poor in terms of getting this infection. And uh, I've been involved in the COVID-19 response in Nigeria, particularly in the FCT. And uh, based on these people we are seeing that they are getting infected, it's affecting everybody. Yeah, initially, yeah, there are people that actually came back from abroad, from UK, from US, or from China. But now, uh, what we are seeing is that it's affecting everybody. But let's also remember that the rich are not living in an island. They have a driver. They have, they uh, got, they got. They have their cooks at home. They have their nannies, and those people, after doing their work in the day, they will go back to their uh, the places that some in living in slums or in the, or other suburb of the town. And from now, we are seeing cases from those where these people are, are, see, are seeing. And sometimes even the rate of spread in those uh, among the poor is even been, it's even higher than uh, the rich persons, uh, because exactly. the rich everybody will have his own room. And in uh, among the people that are living in slums. Five, six, seven people will be sleeping in one room. Twenty people will be uh, staying in one uh, joint with Majalisa, just in, and along the way, uh, mm -hmm. if one person is infected, these uh, can easily spread it to a lot of people. So there is no actually decision between rich and poor when it comes to coronavirus, especially now in Nigeria with the level of transmission we're having. Because we have a, we're having community uh, infection, most of uh, diseases we're having now in Nigeria cannot be explained by when we, who come from abroad and then he infected somebody, and then that person infected yes. someone. So we are having full-blown community infection in so many parts of Nigeria, and rich, poor, uh, everybody is getting infected. That's really worrying. So please, don't think that it's only for the rich people. Um, <laughs> so uh, let me ask you uh, this question, Jamilu, you know. So what is the likelihood that someone will be positive but not infect others among his contacts? Yeah, it's, it's very possible. Um, uh, Dr. Lazarus, I think he was the person that uh, uh, beautifully mentioned how people can get infected. It's true uh, when somebody is uh, coughing or sneezing, or sometimes even talking, he can, uh, the droplets can land on somebody, on, on somebody's uh, mucous membrane, maybe in the nose, eyes, or in the mouth, and, can, and then the virus can get entry into the system. He can get infected. Or maybe if he, uh, contam he the, his uh, secretion contaminates services, and then another one of his contacts touched it. But there are instances that uh, you may be living in one uh, uh, in one space or one house or one home and uh, with somebody that is affected. 
But you may not get, get his contact with his uh, respiratory uh, droplets. And if you are not in contact with the respiratory droplet, you may be lucky that you may get you may not get infected. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, it's not all exposure to the virus that will lead to an infection. Sometimes yeah. the virus may not get as you may even contaminate your hands, uh, but the virus may not get uh, an entry into your system, and then uh, the infection may not establish. So, uh, although if you are living with uh, somebody that is infected, there's higher chances that you get infected, but not all, not not everybody will be infected because of so many factors. That yeah, fantastic, fantastic. All right, so moving on now. Um, so, Dr. Lazarus, what do you think about yeah. the drinking concussions, for example, as a yellow mixture in Kano, they call, they call it Corona vaccine. What is this helpful against COVID-19? <laughs> Thank you for this interesting uh, question, Dr. Mahmoud. Actually, if you browse over the net, social media, you'll be seeing a lot of things being shown there. Yeah, you'll see some, somebody said if you eat garlic, you warm it and you put maybe some uh, pepe in it, that's uh, chili, you can't get infected with coronavirus. So there are a lot of uh, misconceptions going on, I believe. Uh, drinking such concoction is one of, of them, actually. We are scientists, we all know how vaccine is being developed. And we know that at the moment, there is no any vaccine that is approved to be used against uh, COVID-19. The fact is there are a lot of uh, trials ongoing, there's clinical trials ongoing on COVID-19. I think UK have started the on, was it not last Thursday or so? Mm -hmm. And many, many other countries will follow suit. So these concoctions actually that people are taking, even if it is a plant-based medicine, there are procedures, scientific guidelines for which you could develop uh, maybe drug from a plant uh, source. You have to know what are the chemical constituents of such plants, where you carry out phytochemical screening. If you carry out the phytochemical screening, you know which ones are the toxic components of that plant and which ones are not uh, toxic. After that, you have to carry an experiment with animal model to, to test the toxicity of that particular extract. And even after you've done the experiment with uh, animal model, you have to know the level of toxicity. If you know the level of toxicity, then is it something that a synthetic chemist could, could synthesize in the lab? And what is the dosage to be used? All these things have to come into play before a particular drug can be approved for use. And also you have to carry out clinical trials on human to see the efficacy of that particular drug or of that particular medication. Otherwise, if you continue taking such concoctions, they will do more harm actually. Instead of curing the disease, they may end up killing the victim. So That's people true. are seriously advised to stop taking any concoctions because scientifically there is no any medication against uh, COVID-19. What the doctors are doing at the moment is supportive treatments. They follow the symptoms that are being manifested by the patient and try to give medication that could help subside those uh, particular symptoms. But then there is no particular drug that can attack COVID-19 directly and kill it. It has to undergo a full life cycle. That's why they treat only the symptoms Fantastic. until when the person finally appears negative. So people should refrain from taking any concoctions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Good, good, good. All right. So uh, let's move on to the next question. Um, so is there any, so this is to you, Dr. Abdul Razak. Is there any local medicine against COVID-19, for example, alkaloid foods, garlic? I know that Lazarus did mention this, but exactly. perhaps. I think, yeah. Lazarus did, a, did an excellent job of, you know, answering even this question, but you know, let me just add that, since you mentioned alkaloid, in addition to the alkaloid fruits, you know, those fruits that have, uh, that are said to contain alkaloids, there's another thinking that people advance, you know, there's another narrative that says you should consume food that contain, uh, whose pH is more alkaline than acidic because coronavirus survives only in acidic. This is not scientifically tenable because 
Yeah. The food you consume, your body has a system of regulating your pH and maintaining it within a physiological balance. It is true that there are many fruits, vegetables, spices, including alkaloid containing foods, including garlic and herbs. They possess some kind of special therapeutic effects against certain diseases, you know, including infectious diseases, probably including coronavirus disease. However, these, these food, these spices, the vegetables, they should only be consumed as part of the normal diet, as part of the balanced diet that we, we take, but not as a cure for the coronavirus disease. Like Lazarus so eloquently described, you know, the, the whole process of developing any kind of uh, herbal or preparation or even conventional drug takes a long time. It takes a scientific process to be developed. So uh, really, yeah. th th that's, that's the situation. Fantastic, fantastic. All right, so uh, now moving on to, uh, to the next question. Dr. Jamilu, what do you think about this? Can COVID-19 be spread through banknotes? Uh, this is a very interesting question. Um, so far, there are no evidence against or for uh, banknotes spreading the, uh, the coronavirus. However, um, uh, as, uh, I think it was mentioned by Olmasol, uh, the panelists here, uh, contaminated services can be a mode of, of transmission for the coronavirus. So if somebody maybe is coughing or sneezing, and then uh, the droplets fall on the virus, and we know that uh, it can stay for some hours or even some days, depending on the type of materials. So it can be contaminated, and if somebody is uh, infected, uh, if somebody maybe touch, touches the uh, a bank note or coins, he can, uh, and then totally change his noise or eyes, he can get infected. So, uh, so as much as possible, since we don't have evidence, so one should exercise uh, maximum restraint, uh, especially regarding bank notes. So as much as possible, um, uh, maybe as a precautionary measures, if you are living in a, maybe a big town or a big city, and if you can do most of your transaction online, uh, most shops, even corner shops in the neighborhood, accept uh, electronic transfer. Uh, so whatever you want to buy, just transfer the money uh, to them. Uh, so that uh, there won't be uh, contact between uh, the uh, banknote or the currency and uh, the individuals. Uh, however, um, if uh, it's necessary that uh, you have to use banknote, uh, what you need to do is that whenever you uh, handle a banknote, uh, you should wash your hand properly with soap and water. And washing for washing hands uh, has been previous has been uh, variously mentioned is that it has to be very pro uh, properly and then for at least twenty to forty seconds after touching the banknote. Uh, before, so that you will not uh, touch any areas of your body that can get uh, contaminated. Fantastic, fantastic. Thank you very much. All right, so uh, <clears throat> let's quickly move on now. Um, this question is to you, Dr. Abdul Razak. Can you quickly tell us where there is any accepted vaccine for COVID-19 at the moment? Not in clinical trials, vaccine mm -hmm. that has been approved for human use. No, no, there's not. Actually, the, even that uh, Dr. Lazarus has earlier mentioned, in fact, as of April 6th, right, there are more than 200 clinical trials and COVID treatments uh, or vaccines that are either ongoing or they're recruiting patients from the literary reading. Now, and new ones are being added every day. So these drugs are being tested. They range from those that have been proposed for flu treatments, to failed Ebola drugs, to malaria treatments, but none of these drugs are available for, you know, as either vaccine or acceptable drugs for management of COVID-19. Yeah, so whenever, so, you know, the nutshell, in nutshell, I think for people sharing pictures online, everything like that, you know, mention, oh, vaccine has been produced, ETC, you should know that that is not accurate. The, uh, I think last two days during the talk by Dr. Professor Abba Zubair from the Mayo Clinic, he did mention that the kind of average time is usually about 10 years even to produce vaccines. So in fact, in this current situation, I think we're even lucky a lot of scientists are putting all their eggs into COVID-19, COVID-19. This is where we are seeing uh, progress being made so fast. So, but anyway, the answer is, like you said, and Lazarus mm -hmm. also alluded earlier, there is no vaccine at the moment, yeah? All right. All right, so let's move on now. 
Um, Dr. Laros, can you tell us, are antibiotics effective in preventing and treating the new COVID-19? Okay, thank you for this uh, interesting question. We know that uh, antibiotics are mainly used to treat uh, bacterial infection. And there are, we know mechanism by which antibiotic works. They have different mechanisms. So most of these antibiotics are targeted to a specific bacterial pathway. So they are not antiviral medication, whereas antiviral medication are used to treat viral infection. So at the moment, I will say antibiotics are not used in preventing and treating the new COVID-19 uh, disease. And uh, even if doctors happen to use antibiotics in the course of uh, treatment, it may not be directly as a result of what COVID-19. It might, it might be as a result of maybe secondary complications mm -hmm. coming up as a result of the what COVID-19 infection. It can trigger pre-existing bacterial infection. By the time it compromises your immune system, other complications might come in. Mm -hmm. So bacterial infection could be one of them. So the doctors at that point can give you what, antibiotics just to cushion the effect of the what, bacterial infection, but mm -hmm. not to treat the COVID-19. So antibiotics are not used for the treatment of COVID-19. Fantastic, fantastic. Thank you, that's, I think, clearly uh, explained. All right, so um, now, Dr. Jamilu, can you tell us how should I wash and dry clothes, towels and bed lining if someone in my household is a suspected or confirmed COVID-19 patient? Okay, I and mean, this is a very practical question. And uh, as the COVID-19 spread, so many people will have uh, maybe one or two persons in their family that uh, uh, become infected with the COVID-19. And they have to manage their clothing, bed lining, and towels. So the what is advisable um, by the WHO, uh, NCDC in Nigeria is, uh, when uh, those things, if you're, if you're washing them, if you can get a heavy duty uh, gloves, there is these gloves that people like painters or people that are cleaning some areas that are contaminated are using. So if you can use uh, those heavy duty gloves, gloves you, can use, um, you can use them to wash their clothes, uh, their dry clothes, towels, and bed lining. And sometimes those uh, materials can be soiled, maybe with their feces, because they're very sick, or with their vomitus. So in this case, uh, uh, those uh, feces and vomitus should be scraped away from the materials using a hard, flat surface uh, materials to scrape away from the uh, metal bed lining or their clothes. And then uh, the uh, excreta or the waste should be immediately disposed to an area where it will not get contact with uh, human beings. As we know, uh, secretions of uh, people with COVID-19 are infectious and, and people can get infected by contact. And uh, also, if possible, if uh, there is uh, someone has a washing machine, he can uh, use washing machine to uh, uh, wash those materials. At, uh, and then you should set the temperature at 60 to 90 degrees Celsius, so that uh, even if the virus is uh, there, it can uh, uh, get uh, uh, killed by the temperature. And then also, many, very importantly, after handling those materials, uh, one can wear face masks while handling those materials, and then wash his hands properly after handling those other uh, um, and they can also also use uh, disinfectant while uh, mentioning uh, while washing those materials. And then maybe big bed lining or uh, clothes, you can use a big drum or big uh, container where uh, so that uh, you, can, you can also use stick to stir away the material so that uh, uh, he will not get in contact with those materials or it will not splash and get it into his eyes or nose where he can possibly get it with, uh, this uh, with the virus. All right, fantastic. So now I think the next question I uh, would ask you, Dr. Jamilo, again is, if somebody has COVID-19 and the person died, so can someone still contact the disease? So far, there are no evidence that uh, dead bodies can, can uh, transmit the virus from uh, the cops to uh, people that are maybe handling the virus. But however, uh, this is uh, uh, the COVID-19 situation is evolving. There are so many new things that we are learning every day. So what is advisable is to uh, practice maximum restraint. Um, as much as possible, there should be little manipulation of the dead body. I think most of our faith in this kind of circumstances, they provide some leeway where um, there will be minimum contact with the dead bodies. And then uh, when handling the dead body, one should wear gloves, um, apron, plastic apron, so that uh, even if uh, 
uh, secretion or water coming out when the, uh, or anything coming out of the body, the body will not touch it. We have face masks and even face shields so that uh, anything that is uh, coming from the dead body will not come in contact with the person's go, uh, So that even if there are little chance of infection, somebody will not get infected. And uh, some people are also even advocating for burial using body bags so that even if uh, there is a secretion that uh, is uh, emitted into the environment, it will restrict itself into the body bags uh, without uh, contaminating the soil or either or the environment. Fantastic. All right. All right. So I think, um, you know, usually we collect these questions so that we can address them during the Q&A session. But uh, uh, in the interest of time, we'll probably not be able to address some of the questions that we have right now. But I think we can answer one or two that have been asked. Um, uh, so one of these questions, perhaps, uh, since you are part of the part of the COVID-19 tax force in FCT, maybe you might answer that. She said, what type of face mask is medically advisable for prevention of COVID-19? Okay, all right. For, you know, there are several classes of face masks. There is this conventional uh, surgical face masks that uh, doctors usually wear when maybe during operation or certain procedures. And then there are also special uh, face masks that are referred to as respirators or N95. So for um, those special um, respirators or N95 are reserved for health workers that are directly uh, uh, managing persons infected with COVID-19, people that are actually infectious. For the general population, uh, so many uh, countries, in fact, even in Nigeria, so some states like Lagos State and even SCT has uh, issued a uh, recommendation that, in fact, it's not even a recommendation, they have issued orders that everybody that is going out of his house must wear face masks. So what is recommended is just uh, the surgical face masks that you can wear. And unfortunately, because of uh, the COVID-19 situation, uh, a lot of uh, doctors and uh, people in the health sectors are using uh, this face masks. The scarcity of these face masks are becoming very expensive. So if you can get the surgical face masks, like this type that are hot now, you can get um, a, you can use you can use bandana or you can just get cloth clothing uh, clothing material and cover your face. And also, well, um, it's very important uh, while using face masks to use it um, correctly because if you didn't use it correctly, you may get contaminated, and then what you are afraid of. Uh, getting you can get it from the uh, wrong usage of uh, face masks sure. so if you get this face mask this is the common face mask that is uh, available in the market so if you get this face mask uh, how to wear it first you don't touch the uh, outer surface and inner. and then when you go you uh, on the top on the top surface of the face mask uh, there is one iron a metal material so this is to show you this is where uh, uh, this is the top of, uh, upper part of the uh, face mask so just bend it a little so that it can fit perfectly on your nose. So you wear it like this. So whenever you wear, whenever you wear your face mask, you're not supposed to touch the surface of the face mask. So even if you mistakenly uh, touch the surface of the face mask, you have to wash your hands properly with soap and water for 20 to 30 seconds, or use hand sanitizers to wash them. And then uh, you have to uh, also, uh, whenever the face masks are soiled or are wet, you remove them and then dispose them uh, in a place where it will not have contact with in, in the close of this, so that it will just be uh, either burned or incinerated, disposed properly, because it can be contaminated with the materials. And then while removing the face marks, you don't touch uh, the outer surface, you touch uh, the string, either by the side of your face, you touch it, you remove it like this, and then don't allow the other outer or inner surface to touch your hands, and then dispose it in a close uh, uh, dustbin, for proper, uh, for proper uh, incineration. And then after handling, after uh, disposing it, you wash your hands properly with soap and water so that uh, uh, even if it's contaminated, you will not uh, contaminate yourself. But however, there are so many people wearing face masks, they will touch the face mask and then they will clean their face, clean their eyes. Sometimes they will remove the face mask and then uh, clean their nose. So this is a very good practice and they can expose themselves to the virus within their head. So as much as possible, it's advisable that, especially in states that um, recorded uh, confirmed case of COVID-19, if you're going out, use a face mask. And if you can't get a uh, face mask, you can use a bandana or a head tie to cover your nose and mouth. Because these are the easiest route of uh, transmission of getting Fantastic. it. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. All right, thank you very much. I think I'll, I'll probably answer this question. Uh, so Khadija said, many people in Nigeria believe that the viral condition is a lie with videos of people in isolation centers without symptoms. How can Nigeria provide more awareness? I think this is exactly what we are trying to do. So first of all, I would say, 
you should uh, you know pre frequent the uh, nigerian center for disease control website you know there are a lot of these uh, misconceptions cleared and also they have the guidelines yeah and uh, the world Health organizations also provides uh, you know a briefing on uh, i think every two days or something like that so i think it's important to be following that uh, those channels but for us i think what we are trying to do also in science Com communication hub nigeria and other organizations is to ensure that we provide expert guidance to people. So for example, today we are addressing this, uh, some of these questions that have been sent by, by people with experts with proven track record in this area. And this is what we will continue to do on a weekly basis, hopefully. So um, it is really, really important for people watching this not to just go and start following or listening to whatever they find on social media. It's important to follow expert guidance, you know, do some checks, to make sure that whatever you find is from credible source. And of course, if you have questions that you could not get answered through those channels, send it to us in our next briefing, hopefully we can address them. And uh, in the interest of time, I think I will probably just thank all our speakers, Dr. Abirozak from ABU Zaria, Dr. Jamilu from FCT, Dr. Lazarus from Bombay State University, and hopefully we'll have another session with you guys next week to address the uh questions that they may have but if i may end by asking each of you in a short in, in a short sentence to say or give an advice to the people listening to do to this that would be really helpful let's start with you dr abdurazak well thank you very much i think that my message is that uh, we need to be we need to mobilize all the reserve of curiosity that we have i always tell people that you know science it's a way of skeptically interrogating the universe. You know, it's about mobilizing your curiosity, the curiosity that you've always had when you were a child, you know, asking questions. So scientists, we have refused to outgrow that childish curiosity. So whenever, whenever we, you see something that's really fantastic, because it's in the nature of humans to want to believe very fantastic stories. There was an accident, or there was a plan to, to eliminate people, to control population, all of that. Those are really very interesting stories that we find human by our nature. You know, we find appealing because it kind of it, it puts the blame on someone else. So the moment you see that, put a red flag, ask yourself, you know, the rational, critical questions, to consult with the experts. There are websites that have that are specifically dedicated to debunking things like that. You know, it's, it's always good to consult them, consult, not consult the, the constituted authority, the Ministry of Health of your state or your local government or the country, the CD, the NCD. These are the people with the right uh, knowledge and the right aggregator of knowledge products that will really help to, to foster the right attitude towards it and not conspiracy theories or blame things. Fantastic. Dr. Jamiru, what do you have to say? Okay, so in conclusion, um, uh, people who should know that uh, corona, coronavirus or COVID-19 is real and is currently rapidly spreading in Nigeria. So it's very important for everyone to take a message from our public health authorities very seriously. The WHO, the NCDC, our safe Minister of Health, and those messages that we keep on repeating, washing our hands frequently, uh, observing social distancing, and staying, and more importantly, staying at home. If you don't have anything doing, stay at home. In fact, there are so many states in Nigeria that are under lockdown, so you don't need to go out. You don't need to go to your work, stay at home. And if you need to have, if you need to go out, whenever you go out, as, as soon as you finish what you're doing, go back. Because the longer you stay outside, the more likelihood you get with contact with somebody that has the disease and you may, and you may get infected. And then lastly, I want, I want us to stay, uh, to continuously uh, stay involved and organized and energized. Uh, reach out to our family members, or to our friends, to our colleagues, either using phone calls or via the internet. There are so many channels, WhatsApp, uh, video calling, Zoom, and so many, so many channels of communication. If you engage them, some people may be bored, some people may be depressed. And you can also, uh, with that, you can also uh, also read read books and then uh, uh, interact with uh, so many. Uh, there are so many uh, online courses that you can do to uh, develop yourselves. And also, uh, in, our, in our way, if meeting ways, we, see, we can see how we can support uh, other people of the communities. Everybody has a, has a way. Maybe 
maybe your neighbor is uh, is a daily wage earner and maybe he's under lockdown he, and he can't uh, get uh, his means of livelihood. If you can support them, you can uh, you can doing that you can save lives. It will prevent him from going out even uh, amidst the lockdown. So as much as possible, we should support ourselves, support our family members, support our neighbors, so that uh, we join hands together and fight COVID-19 and eradicate it in Nigeria. Thank Fantastic. You uh, Dr. Lazarus, any last words? Yeah, I think they have said a lot. I will use, uh, there is a saying that prevention is better than cure. So I think uh, we should listen to the advice of the experts, the scientists and the medical practitioners. And even if they have rightly said, we should follow correct uh, websites, which are scientifically proven to contain uh, scientifically proven information like the WHO, the NCDC, and the CDC websites. That's where we can get uh, scientifically proven information. But we should refrain from following other media platforms where there are a lot of misconceptions going on and in case we're not clear about anything we should please be we should please be able to ask questions because asking questions will bring more clarification by doing that we're protecting ourselves protecting our parents and protecting our young ones and uh, in general protecting the the country as a whole thank you fantastic Okay, so uh, I would say if you have questions, you are watching this or you'll watch this later on and you have questions, you can just send those questions to us on Science, Science Communication Home Nigeria uh, on Facebook or on Twitter, or you can email us through the website. And hopefully we'll have another session next week. I would like to use this opportunity to thank our fantastic speakers for uh, you know giving up their time to be with us today. And uh, to you guys, stay safe. And uh, please stay at home if you can. Thank you very much. Bye bye for now. Thank you. Okay.